A land from the Arabian Nights, home of Sinbad the Sailor. Filled with secrets and magic, the kingdom of scents and colors. A land with many faces, diverse and surprising. As wild as it is peace-loving. A country that lives out its traditions and welcomes the modern age. Oman. In the heart of Oman, in the middle of the desert, only highly adapted animals survive. Such as the Arabian oryx antelope. They can go for several days without water. Their white fur reflects the sun's rays and protects them from the heat. Thousands of them once roamed the deserts of the Arabian Peninsula. Today, these are the last of their kind. Even these oryx antelope are no longer free and wild. Quite the opposite, they are fenced in, in a large high security area for their own protection. For the antelope, the fenced off area is far too small. They cannot even find enough food here. So a team of experts looks after them. Like the biologist Zahir Sulim Al Alawi and the vet Bishnu Babu Tiwari. The proud Arabian onyxes are fed twice a day with hay that has to be brought here from many kilometers away. Oryx antelopes usually follow long migration paths through the vast desert, looking for food. Their captivity creates a lot of issues, such as behavioral problems and stress. The biologist and the vet have to keep the animals under close observation so they can intervene in time. The important thing is hunting, hunting here. So the number will be will reduce the last years. So only the our solution for uh, make it enclosure enclosure. Now we are now we're keeping them here like a domestic animal. You can see here. You can see this is the herd here. This is what we're using. It's especially for domestic animals. Now we are giving our orif. I have one expectation. They have to decide one release program in the wild with the secure environment. We have to maintain security from the, our local people. They must know about the value of urban works and uh, punishment should be, must be strong, not like as, yes, uh, you know, sometime 50 real or sometime, okay, hi, hello, uh, this is the first time for me, not like this. Should be strong and given lifetime, they must be inside the prison. Oil deposits in the reservation has meant the area has been made even smaller. New roads are now making this unspoiled and enormous desert accessible for the workers on the new development. There is no longer a space for the oryx antelope in their native land. From the reserve in Haima, it is almost a whole day's drive through the desert to the so-called incense route in the Dofar government. There are only a few places in the world where frankincense trees grow, and Dofar is one of them. This already brought wealth and status to Oman a long time ago. As they are here, the trees are partly grown in plantations. 
but most of the frankincense trees in Dofar are still wild. Their ownership is not fixed, but handed down through century-old family traditions and respected accordingly. Fatima Ardil and Toful Zaid do not share the trees, but they do share the labor. They both walk for kilometers into the mountains to harvest the sticky, milky tree sap. The tree is reluctant to give up its frankincense. This job is very tough. I am using techniques from my great-grandfather. The first thing we do when we collect the frankincense, we work all day here and harvest nothing. And then, after 15 days, we come back and we will cut again and we will collect nothing. The third time, we will start collecting, but the quantity will be very little. And the fourth time and the fifth time will be more and more. But it is very hard work. Fatima is already a grandmother, but still makes the journey several days a week. The best time to start is in the hot season, the dry season. And then we continue until the beginning of the monsoon. Then the weather changes. It becomes cold, so the income becomes less. But now, most of the time, we continue with this job. Frankincense is not just frankincense. There are three or four types, and there is one that is white, and then grey, and dark ones. And the white one is the best one. After cutting, the tree will get spoiled, but if you do it properly, you can cut for a long time. Today, the women are cutting the tree for the third time. They'll be able to take some frankincense home. To the southwest of Dofar, the mist from the sea is sometimes trapped in the highlands and conjures up blossoms in the barren landscape. Desert roses, aloe vera and water hyssop trees have found their niche in the southwest of these mountains. The local people use many of these plants medicinally. The incense route from the desert crosses the highlands as a busy highway. From there, it only goes down, a straight descent into the center of Dofar to Salala. Like the capital Muscat in the north of Oman, Salala is also a city that's being rebuilt. Everywhere, new road networks and buildings are going up simultaneously, changing the country considerably in just a few years. Salala is the metropolis of the south. Palm tree-lined beaches and a holidaymaker's paradise for frozen Europeans or the Arabian neighbors of the Sultanate. Even the underwater world leaves nothing to be desired. Along the coast towards the east, a fish fauna rich in species inhabits the coral reefs. And where there are lots of fish, there are a lot of fish hunters. In winter, dolphins swim up to the stone coasts and southern beaches, almost close enough to be touched. Here, the ocean mammals find plenty of food. After high tide, they swim back out to sea with full bellies.
It's not only dolphins who profit from the diversity in the coastal waters. Fishing has always been one of the main food sources for the Omanis. With small boats and traditional dhows, the fishermen go out to sea every day to provide for their families. In the village of Mirbat, to the northeast of Salala, almost all of the locals live from fishing. The village life plays out in the port. Everyone wants a bit of the big catch, and often it's enjoyed then and there. Raw or on the harbour restaurant grill. Typical for Salala, car door delivery. One could be forgiven for thinking the drive-in was invented here. But it's not only Salala's ocean that's full of delicacies. The town itself is referred to as the Garden of Oman. All along the coast and far into the city, there are row upon row of plantations. Their yields cover much of the country's fruit and vegetable needs. Dates do not grow in the south of Oman only coconut trees. Most of the plants and vegetable types in the north of the country can be found here too. The plantations cover a wider area here, different to the small oases of the north. Yet the people in the south of Oman have taken over some of the wisdom from the northern desert oases. Layering. High-growing perennial plants create an upper layer, providing shade for the smaller, more delicate flowers. The Garden of Salala, an oasis in very big style. On the edge of the plantation, the farmers sell their fresh produce directly from little stalls. Like most of the small farmers, Asfirodam does not come here from Oman, but from India. Its vegetables, on the other hand, are local. These are all from Salala. This banana and the other one called milk banana come from nearby farms. Nothing is imported from outside Oman. Everything comes from Salala, coconuts and papayas. A kilo from this banana costs 300 biza and the other one costs 600 biza. This is milk banana and this is Salala banana. Those who want to sell something in Salala are well advised to set up shop near the road. The city's inhabitants do not like to get out of their cars, neither to eat nor to buy food. Without setting a foot on the ground, they order the favorite local southern refreshment. Coconut water. The juice of a coconut that has been harvested too early, so it's not quite ripe. Cooled and expertly prepared, it's simple, tasty, and even healthy. Making the vegetable ordering go very smoothly indeed. Like in many Arabian countries, the goods and services industry mainly employs cheap labor from the Philippines, Pakistan, or India. It's not easy for a migrant worker to get a foothold in Oman, and like Asfirodam has done, to then bring the family over too. I'm from India, from Hyderabad. 
I came to Salala in 1995. Before that time, my father and my brother used to work here. They asked me to come here and they arranged a working visa for me with their Omani sponsor. At the beginning, it was very difficult for me because I couldn't speak Arabic. But now, thank God, things are better as I can. The Dofar Mountains rise along the eastern edge of Salala, just half an hour's drive away. This is where the largest predator on the peninsula has retreated to, high up to 1,800 meters. The few people that are allowed to set foot here can do so only for research purposes. The road is a little bumpy. Even at this altitude, it is hot and dry on the Jebel Samhan, the highest mountain of Dufar. This is like leopard range here, and uh, these animals, they are quite elusive animals. They live in quite, um, uh, they try to be, they are shy animals. They live far away from people. And um, we have to walk uh, quite a long distance sometimes to find their, uh, you know, core habitats and set up camera traps and look for their sign in those areas. Hadi Al-Hikmani had already come into contact with leopard researchers from England when he was a child. For years, they stayed in his family home at the foot of the Dofar Mountains. Later, as a young man, he would accompany the researchers into the almost impassable heights of his homeland and learned to respect and understand this large and rare feline predator. The smallest traces tell him a lot about the animals and their behavior. We've seen the liberties coming down. Now used used to stick up to this to the escarpment along the, you know, the top of the mountain as well. But in the last since the last five years, we've seen it moving down towards the foothills. And it's a good indication that the liberty can go back to its circle range. But the problem is they will come in in conflict with people because people live along these foothills and then they might take their livestock and that's when the conflict starts. Hadi Hikmani and his team of native rangers and nature conservationists are learning everything they can about the population and distribution of the big cats. They have even put up cameras in inaccessible spots that are triggered by motion sensors. We have to find evidence that the leopard is still uh, present in, in Oman. And we started in Dufar Mountains where we have put all these camera traps. And they provide us a lot of data about the leopard numbers, their breeding behavior, their mating, and also their presence. So they are um, small cameras, but they provide a very valuable and useful information. Before they reset the secret cameras, Hadi wants to know if the device has captured anything. What we know is that the leopard have been declining for quite a long time. And um, since we started the project, we have seen um, the leopards still roaming in Dufar Mountains. We have seen leopards actually breeding, which is good, uh, you know, information and good news as well. So what we've seen, you know, the population maybe its range being collapsed into a small area, but they are still uh, roaming the far mountains. That means, you know, we cannot just stop here. We have to, um, you know, do more work to protect this uh, tiny small population. I think the most important thing is to see yourself contributing 
to save mm -hmm. um, and in, in critically endangered species that almost gone to extinct from your region. We have lost uh, some other uh, mammal species from the region and uh, we cannot afford to lose uh, the Arabian leopard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So far, Hadi and his team have been able to prove the existence of 35 animals in the Dofar Mountains. Shockingly, this is the largest population in the world. The total of Arabian leopards still in the wild is 200 animals. Even up here, the frankincense harvesters and livestock herders are getting far too close for comfort. Further down at sea level, a storm is brewing. Strong and unexpected, it has devastating consequences for the vegetable traders. The capricious weather is also causing a phenomenon on the beaches. Large amounts of crustaceans are being washed ashore. A feast for the seagulls. The storm is the harbinger of a new season. The Karif. Karif is the name of the Asian southwest monsoon that moves along the coast of Dofar from mid-June to mid-September. The storm changes the countryside. Strong rains, like the ones brought by the monsoon from India, are rare in Oman. The moisture rises up the rock face of the Dofar Mountains and condenses. During this time, the mountains are shrouded in dense fog. The condensation falls as a constant, fine drizzle. The Karif regularly creates a blooming natural spectacle. Occasionally, the Oman sounds just like a meadow on the corner of a forest in Europe. It's the lark which is raising its young in the fresh grass. The annual weather phenomenon is responsible for much more moderate temperatures than elsewhere on the Arabian Peninsula. This attracts visitors from the heat-stricken neighboring states. Hordes of tourists depend upon and disturb the green idyll. But for the picnic in open nature, anywhere will seem to do.
the Omanis are more selective and opt for a quieter spot with a view. The young men come from the north of the country. <laughs> we ran away from the heat. The temperature in Nizwa is almost 47 to 48 degrees centigrade. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's between 26, 27, up to 30 here in Salala. You can see the difference. It's almost 20 degrees. Over 300,000 tourists visit Salala during the Karif, which is three times the city's population. Less than 2,000 of them come from Europe, even though it's a worthwhile sight, watching drizzling rain cause so much pleasure. Even if the rest of the Arabian Peninsula is on holiday here, the work in Salala must go on. Like at the University of Dofar, a private institution in the north of the city. The new campus can easily cater for 10,000 students. Female students are in the clear majority and lecturers like Kayar Alansi are more sought after than ever. When I was six years old, when I was in school, usually the teacher asked us what you want to be in future. We said usually doctor or policeman or officer. Yesterday, I was with the Scott and uh, guidance cabin. And there are some small students, like 10 years or nine years. When I ask, what you want to be in the future? Some of them, they say, I want to be engineering. I want to be a doctor. I want to go to the space. And they have courage to see something more than just to be a teacher. So the thing is changing because of education. Only 30 years ago, the majority of Omanis were illiterate. There were only three Quran schools in the whole country. Now, over 90% of children are going to a regular school. Do you remember last class what we were talking about, the management? And we give example of the private sector in Oman and how it's important to play its role as social responsibilities in Oman. We should not depend only in oil. We should also depend in private sectors and to enhance this area. Forget about oil. If you notice these years... We By educating its young with an international outlook, Oman is preparing for a time when the oil has run out. English is considered a trading language and already taught in primary school. The Dofar University has been developed according to the American model. Bachelor and master's degrees are offered and the lectures are, of course, in English. Why planning is the first function in Japan? One tips in, uh, from uh, the... It's when it comes to the women rights in the Middle East, actually, the first female minister in the Middle East is Omani woman, and the first ambassador in the Middle East is Omani woman, and the first woman who get a PhD in uh, GCC, and second in the uh, Middle East, she was Omani woman. In 2008, the Sultan issued a decree that women had the right to own land. Until then, it was a privilege reserved only for men a right many women in other countries on the Arabian Peninsula can only dream of. I'm so happy because I live here with, that, with equal right with my brothers, and we live in uh, harmony and in peace with dignit dignity and respect, and this is the most important thing. We've been recognized, uh, we can speak our minds, and we are respected. But in reality, once married, the life of most Omani women continues to play out in the home kitchen. But here, everyone is allowed to dream. During the Karif, many of the Bedouins bring their camels from the searing heat of the desert to the cooler south. It's an old nomadic tradition.
Migrating birds also find their way to the misty coast in southwest Oman. Despite the numerous building sites, there are still many unspoiled parts of the coast waiting to be discovered. Habitats for mangroves. The trees, which are up to 15 meters high, are salt tolerant and grow in the intertidal zone. Their so-called stilt roots lend them support at any water level. Just like the mangroves, many of the bird species survive in this border area between salt and fresh water. Flamingos, little bitterns, little egrets and grey herons. When visitors from the desert come in the summer, some places can even get a little crowded. Many of the birds are only guests themselves. Greater flamingos can be found in Oman all year round. These youngsters still need to work a little on their colour. The camels are living up to their nickname, Ship of the Desert. That the water preservation experts are eating salty seagrass may seem counterintuitive at first. Being able to drink salt water is a rare ability in the animal kingdom. The camels can do so thanks to their high-performing kidneys. There are only a few places in the world where camels can take a bath. One of these places is the lagoon Kwarori, at the foot of the Samhuram Fortress in eastern Salala. Samhuram was built in the 4th century BC. The doubled city wall protected the frankincense storage areas. From here, it was loaded onto ships and exported. The hidden natural bay in the lagoon was the ideal reloading site for valuable goods. Another fortress dating back to the 2nd century BC is currently being excavated in the center of Salala. Alongside another outpost in the desert and the frankincense plantations in the north, the two fortresses make up a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the so-called Land of Frankincense. Said al-Amri, is one of the many archaeologists from all over the world trying to unearth the secrets of this antique settlement. Al-Balid city is a historical city that has flourished in this region for many centuries because of frankincense trading activities. The city flourished during the period between the 10th to 12th centuries. Meanwhile, the city was divided internally into three main areas the king's area, including the castle and the large mosque, the area of settlements and houses, and the area for trading and storing frankincense and other commodities. Currently, we believe that these structures are small rooms, but this is only a hypothesis and it needs more evidence to be proven. However, our current belief is that these structures are small rooms. Al-Balid is to tell the history of the country as an archaeological park. Reconstructions and restorations will serve as attractions. The use of wood as a building material is particularly interesting. 
As I've told you, they also used wood in their buildings because wood gives a structure more stability and strength during disasters such as earthquakes. This wood probably comes from the local tree called mitan in Arabic and mutin in Sheri language, and they bring it from the nearby hills and plains. The excavation and restoration work are currently centered on the old palace. We believe that it's from the 10th century. According to the discoveries and archaeological excavations, the city flourished and was divided this way during this period. Also, the castle reached its ultimate fortified structure. Therefore, we're currently testing this hypothesis. There are only a few places in the world where the past and the present are so close to each other, where tradition and modernity go hand in hand like they do in Oman. This is particularly evident in the souk, the bazaar, an integral part of this country's everyday life. Many of the goods on offer are probably the same as hundreds of years ago. All the different types of frankincense are, of course, here too. Mariam Umfaraj does not sell the precious sap at her stall, but her speciality incense mixtures. You mean my favorite incense? I really like this kind of oud incense. It consists of sandalwood, agar wood, musk, and two or three nice perfumes. Smoking in an incense burner, Mariam allows her customers to try the different types. Once they have made their choice, they will fill their own burner at home to perfume all the rooms and even their clothes and hair. Some people prefer to buy normal plain argyle wood, others like waxed argyle wood, others like perfumed argyle wood or rice at argyle wood, according to customers' preferences. <laughs> If God wills, we will continue, but we don't know who will come after us. We have worked in this profession for more than 20 or 30 years. We may die tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, who knows? However, there are definitely other people working in this profession and they will continue preserving it. A comparatively modern development is the so-called kuma, one of the two headdresses without which an Omani does not leave the house. An entire section of the souk sells the colorful little embroidered hats. They are no longer embroidered in Oman, but sewn together here and sometimes individually adapted. Umani boys grow up with them, and it becomes second nature knowing whether the hat is enough or a turban is needed for the occasion. We use the turban in official and social events such as weddings and Eid, as well as during working hours, while we use the embroidered cap at normal times, such as going for a walk or shopping with the family. Yes, indeed. It's possible to coordinate the color of the turban or the cap with the color of the dress. However, the color of the gentle white dress is consistent in nature with all colors.
An occasion that clearly calls for a turban is the horse show at the end of the summer season. Even the president of the National Riding Federation is in attendance. The genealogy of each Arabian horse used to be passed on orally, but at some point this knowledge was lost. Nevertheless, the Omani are proud of their elegant animals. In comparison to European breeds, they are small horses, yet are said to carry heavier loads faster and further than other horses. The unity between man and horse is the event's motto. It is actually meaning the strong bond between the riders and the horse as well, so they can be always together and uh, that they are uh, having a strong tie with, with each other. And it is also part of the strong friendship between the riders of different uh, parts of, uh, of Oman. So they are like holding hands and being like being so strong friendship between themselves and the, and the horse as well. The finale is the lying down to sleep of the animals. It's hard to train into the horses and considered as the ultimate sign of dedication the horse can show its rider. I'm a big fan of the many horses and the riders. I'm having a very strong tie with them. For us, uh, we are in the community of the horse and we love them so much. Uh, we take care of them and we even uh, uh, take care of them as like our kids. At the end of August, the monsoon period slowly comes to an end. To the west of Salala, on the way to Yemen, the water that will soon dry up for many months is still gushing. Whilst there may be larger and more impressive waterfalls elsewhere in the world than the Ain Khor, and the rivers and streams are not spectacular, it does seem to be a life's ambition for the desert dwellers to drive their off-road sedans to these sources of yearning at least once. Social media in the Arabian Peninsula is flooded with water-themed selfies. This is home, and no one is surprised if one goes for a swim fully dressed.
On the coast to the west of Salala, in Mutsail, there is another water feature to discover and admire. The notorious blowholes. Particularly high waves of surf push water fountains up through holes in the rock. For those eager to see plenty of Omanis enjoying themselves outdoors, the Karif season is not to be missed. The end of the monsoon season also means the end of the Salala festival, a folk festival as well as a cultural event for the city's visitors. The visitors are mainly Arabian tourists. The locals entertain their guests with the Al Ayala dance. It's only performed by male dancers as it was originally a dance symbolizing victory in battle. <laughs> Behind the scenes, Nafa Mustahayil is baking traditional Omani rakik bread. The fire has been burning for hours at the bottom of the meter-deep hole. Thank God, I don't feel tired, even though I sit here from 7 in the evening until midnight. Because we deal with many people and visitors coming from different places and nationalities. We also have friends here surrounding us and they come to buy bread from us. We don't feel tired. Every few minutes, she has to bend down into the hole and rearrange the breads. What I have on my face is to avoid the heat and the ash that comes out from the oven. As you see, I have to face the oven for the whole day. This mask is really effective in protecting my face from the heat. How nice to at least appear to have found a place to cool down. And a place where the family can openly celebrate together without inhibition. Oman is trying to bridge the gap between old customs and the new digital age, between national pride and opening up the country to international partnerships. According to the UN Development Programme, Oman is in first place when it comes to social and economic improvement in the last 40 years. What do the Omanis think about all the changes that have happened in such a short space of time? Oman changed from tradition to be modern, but still uh, have its identity. And this is, uh, we are very take care of that things, that we will be modern, but we have to keep our identity with us. This can be said of the country's trading goods, as well as the handicraft of a millennia old culture. Because we've learnt it from our ancestors and we have to pass it on, that is our duty. Oman's different habitats offer surprising diversity and shape its people. Here all my bears have been living all their life. Grand and grand, grand grandfather have been living here in the desert. And we've been growing here in the desert. The 
is home for us. The country is home to impressive natural spectacles and a diverse animal kingdom. And when tamed, Oman can be transformed into a true Garden of Eden. These crops have been growing here for a long time. Onion, garlic, fenugreek, garden cress and other field crops. We'll continue growing these in Oman. But above all, Oman is the land of Sinbad. The land of seafarers. We inherited this profession a long time ago from our parents and grandparents. My father and his were all working in shipbuilding, and we will continue. We will bring our children here and teach this profession. Oman, a land from the fairy tales of the Arabian Nights.